I found what I wanted when I found the Lord. I found more than pleasures of earth could afford. I know that woman that came to him that day. Give me a heart to worship before you. Give me a heart to love and adore you. Give me a heart to praise thy name and to love you just the same. Oh, 
Let's turn to Titus chapter 2, where we were this morning. Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Paul has been instructing this young man how to conduct himself and how to teach others. Younger men, younger women, older men, older women. And he is telling them that they are to deny the world and live clean and li clean lives that represent a good witness to the Lord Jesus and godly in this present world. In verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus is definitely coming. There's no doubt about it. I used to tell you exactly when almost. I mean, I could pull my charts and had it pretty well zeroed in. Uh, I'm not as certain now as I was. I just know he's coming. And I know that our main business is to get ready to have an all-out battle with his enemies. The longest day we're on the earth, we should be fighting and winning against his enemies for his glory. And when he comes, we'll be ready to go. And you needn't be worried, afraid you'll be so involved in the battle, you won't hear him call you. I mean, when he comes, you'll immediately be notified. And you, that'll be the time to drop your battle axe and go up in the sky to meet him in there. And this blessed hope is called a blessed hope because it will comfort you. This thing is not going to go on indefinitely. There's not going to be just an endless succession of this thing. No matter how many years it drags out, there's an end to it. And Jesus Christ is definitely coming. There's going to be a glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And when he comes, it's going to be something else. It's, boy, is it ever going to be spectacular. You may have seen some spectacular displays when they dedicated the Statue of Liberty after they made the refurbishments. You may have seen parades and all kinds of fireworks and, and fancy shows and to celebrate this, that, and the other on the worldly scale, and you say, wow, I've never seen anything so impressive in my life. You haven't seen anything yet. When Jesus Christ comes, the glorious appearing of, his, of our Savior, you talk about knocking them dead, it's literally going to happen. Because when he comes, he will come with ten thousands of his saints. Thousands upon thousands, ten thousand, ten thousands. Literally millions of his saints in robes of white. They'll be riding white horses. And then it won't be imaginary horses galloping through the air. They'll be real ones. You say, why, well, you don't think real horses go through the air? Why, well, I certainly do. My God makes this, oh, this whole earth gallop through the air. I don't think it'd be any, any problem to make a horse do it. He can do things we can't do right now. And he's going to put on quite a display when his son arrives. It's going to be different. You know, when he came before, you remember? It was almost unnoticed. Just some shepherds out on a hill. Some wise men saw his star and followed it. Took them about two and a half years. You're going to see the nativity scenes around. All of them lie. First place, it's Jesus' birthday. is not on December 25th. Second place, God didn't want you to know his birthday because he knew that people would make a fool of themselves just like they have over Nimrod's birthday. So he didn't, he's fixed it so that nobody can figure out when it is. When you get to heaven, you find out when he's born, you'll say, ah, I'll declare you weren't born on the 25th of December. He'll say, no, that was Nimrod's birthday. You were on the wrong track all the time. And, uh, but when, when he was born on this earth, and it certainly wasn't December 25th, it wasn't even in December, it was in the spring. But when he was born on the earth, there was a star appeared in the east. And wise men started out then. And it took them two to two and a half years to come from the east to get to this. And I just say this because, not because we celebrate Christmas, because we don't believe in it. Uh, Jesus never did say celebrate my birthday. Have a nice big blowout for my birthday, folks. I'll tell you what we are going to have very shortly. We're going to have the Lord's Supper. He did say do that. By drink, eating this bread, drinking this cup, you do show my death till I come. Now, he said, do that. He did say baptize in water, and we do that. But he never said celebrate my birthday. And so we don't do that. 
But for those who do celebrate what they think is his birthday, uh, let me point out a few errors. I'm going to put this in your mind so you can't enjoy any of the nativity scenes. Because you're going to see a bunch of them up all over the country around here. You notice all the nativity scenes are so neat. You know, they have this beautiful little manger filled with nice clean straw. And it's all glowing and clean. It was not. It was full of maggots and manure. The stables were not nice, fresh, lovely places. They were places of filth and germs. And had it not been for God's intervention, both the baby and the mother would have died of childbed fever from infection, being born in such a mess in the midst of a sewer. Now, if you think it was lovely, you go down here to one of these stables that hasn't been cleaned in a couple of days. And you walk through there, and what you step in, what you smell, and that's what was in that stable. And that's where Jesus was born. Uh, now, there were some shepherds out on the hill outside of Bethlehem, and the angels appeared to them. And they did make haste and come in. There were shepherds present, but that's all. Now, in the nativity scenes, you're going to see the three wise men bringing their gifts. Uh uh. They didn't arrive for nearly two years, two or three years later. You say, how do you know that? Because I read the Bible. It's very plain. When the shepherds came, they saw a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes in a manger. Because they came right in, right after the birth had taken place. When the wise men came, they inquired of Herod, because they were looking for the son of a king. They were looking for a king, and a king would be born in a king's house. So they went to the king's house and said, where is this king? And Herod got upset. He didn't know there'd been any king born. And so he said, you go and find him, and you come tell me where he is, and I'll worship him too. I'll, fix it. I'll worship him. We'll eliminate any heirs to the throne around here. And the wise men went. And you remember the Lord warned them in a dream. They went. They did not go to a manger. They did not see a baby. It said they went and saw the young child, a completely different word from baby, in his house. They saw a little boy, probably two years old or so, two, two and a half years old. And then the Lord warned them, you remember, to go away and go a different direction to go home. And they did. And then Herod found it out, and he was in a fury because they didn't come back and tell him they'd found this one who was born. And so he went into a rage, and he was trying to find him. And he ordered the slaughter of all the babies in that whole area. What was it, two years and under? Because he knew that it would happen two years before. And to be sure he got them all, he had them all killed. Unfortunately for Satan, God had blown the whistle to Joseph, said, get the baby and her mother and get them out of here go to Egypt. For it's written out of Egypt, have I called my son. You know, it looks like the devil would have read that. But, and known that Jesus is going to come out of Egypt anyhow. But anyway, that will spoil the nativity scenes for you. Every time you see one, you think, uh-huh, they didn't read the Bible very close. Because the wise men did not come. And, you know, you hear all these songs, the, we three kings of the Orient are nice songs. I have no quarrel with the songs, except they're pro there could have been a dozen wise men, two dozen, I don't know. No, there were three. No, there were three gifts. That's where you get the three. And uh, we don't know how many there were. God figured people to worry themselves silly about, so he didn't bother to tell them. See, God doesn't worry about a lot of these little, little piddly details, and so he doesn't give people anything to, to stew about. I just thought I'd mess it up a little bit for you. And if you're going to celebrate Christmas, you, which you don't need to anyway, but if you're going to do it, you better do it sometime in April or May. That's probably when it was. And Lord, don't tell the Catholics because they've already set aside Mother Mary's day for May, you know, May, you know. All right, let's look a little further here. The glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, it's going to be something else. His first coming was very quiet, very uneventful as far as the world was concerned. Their angels spoke out in the sky. There was a great angelic demonstration. 
but only a few shepherds saw it. And, uh, but when he comes back again, it's not going to be like that. When this glorious appearing is spoken of here, looking for his glorious appearing, he's coming out of the heavenlies with an army of millions of saints on white horses, accompanied by legion upon legion, countless legions of angels, and they're going to sweep through the skies. And you talk about the satellites and Challenger. They're going to go around this earth and there'll be so much light on it, it'll be lit up from one end to the other with the brilliance of his coming. Because the Bible says, every eye shall see him. It says men are going to run and crawl into the rocks and hills and beg to be hidden from the one that they're looking at going to scare the living hound out of folks. The wicked folks. There's going to be some of God's folks here. They're going to shout hallelujah. But there's going to be a bunch more that are a long way from there. And they're going to be trying to crawl in a hole somewhere and hide from the brightness of his glory. I'll tell you another exciting thing. You know, if this thing goes along much longer, most of us are going to be in that train riding horses. Now, I'm not much of a horseman, thank and the horses are quite thankful for that. But um, they, when, when I get to heaven, I'm going to be in that company. And it's going to be something else to be riding in that train and watch this. And we're going to see sights we've never, that's never been seen before. And God's going to put on quite a display to astonish and astound this world, this old wicked world that's rejected his son. See, God hasn't even begun to show what he can do yet. We just seen, we've seen a glimmer of his glory here and there. We haven't seen anything yet to what God's capable of doing. I believe in this deliverance move. God is going to sweep and he's going to knock the daylights out of the enemy and shake them and scare the daylights out of the kingdoms of darkness. And then I believe there's going to be a great reversal and the enemy is going to come with savage fury. Antichrist will ride to the top. And when he does, he'll crush out all opposition and smash everything and take over the world. The Bible says so. And you're not going to stop that. But you can put the brakes on it. How would you like to do that? I mean, I'm not in a particular hurry for him to take over, are you? When I read over there what happens to the believers, I'm not in a particular hurry for the Antichrist to take over. I like it better the way it is or even better. So I think it behooves us to give ourselves to doing the works of Jesus, which will hold back that day. It's coming. And I've had demons tell me, get out of the way, Whirly. You know these things have to happen. They're written in that awful book, and you're hindering it. You and your raggy tags, get them out of the way. That's why you see that sign out there. I think, Arnie, are you responsible for that raggy tag sign out there? Did you make that? Somebody did. Oh, Ron Grayman did that. Okay. The demon told me, he said, get your raggy tags out of the way. You're messing things up. Call my army raggy tags. Well, I guess we look kind of like raggy tags to the enemy. And how, how embarrassing and how humiliating it must be for a few hundred believers here and then scattered across the country and around the world to be actually putting the skids under the plans of the mighty ones and causing them to have to go back to the drawing board and start all over and regroup and, and replan just because a bunch of believers believed Jesus and messed up everything for them. I kind of find that exciting just to throw that in the devil's teeth. You say, well, that's dangerous. Well, you're in danger anyway. Didn't you know that? If you don't think you're in danger, go out there and walk across the expressway. Hmm? Did you ever try that? Now do it with your eyes closed. See what happens. Did you ever get in your bathtub? Did you know how many people slip in their bathtub and break their neck every year? Now don't go home and say, well, the preacher said you better not bathe anymore. <laughs> I didn't say that. I'm just saying we live in danger all the time. And there's no use getting all shook up because there's danger around. The AIDS menace is sweeping, and probably in the next two years, we're going to have uh, more people dying than you can shake a stick at. They're going to have death houses around. 
like they had during the Black Plague. There are going to be so many people dropping dead. Within 10 to 12 years, one quarter of the United States population will die, about 50 million people. In Africa, they're saying that it's possible that in the next two years, 75 million people will drop dead because they've deliberately been infected with AIDS. Who did it? The World Health Organization. How sweet. How humanitarian. To put it in the smallpox vaccination and give it to the Africans. It's a man-made virus. An awful plague, a curse, and God's let it run like crazy. And he's saying to you Christians, you will get close to me. You will. Not you might or you possibly could choose to. You either do or curtains. You better learn how to fight. There's not anything else. No, there's no other way. You're not going to be. The, the insurance companies will collapse in the next few years. They'll not be able to bear the weight of $140,000 a patient for those 14 months when the AIDS patient dies. The hospitals will be jammed to overflowing with AIDS patients. The fast food industry will collapse because everybody be scared to death. So if you're going to eat Wendy's and McDonald's, you better stuff now because they're going down. <laughs> Nobody, everybody will be afraid to eat at those places. I was reading somewhere that of the most susceptible group to AIDS in New York City, 90% of those people work in restaurants. Probably just an accident. Hmm? You better get informed. You say, are you trying to scare us? Yeah. If I could scare the devil out of you, I would. I sure would. If I could make you wake up and realize these days are critical, you're not going to live here forever. You say, well, you think you might die of AIDS? I might. So what? You say, are you one of them? No. <laughs> I thought I better put that in because somebody will go out and say, that preacher said he might. I knew he was strange. <laughs> I've got news for you. That virus is not... It's not confined to any group. That is not true. The ones in Africa are almost 100% heterosexual. And a lot of other places too. And it's spreading like you would not believe and the government will not tell the truth because they don't want a panic on their hands. And that's exactly what would happen to panic. The Satanist organization with wholesale killings and mass uh, sacro human sacrifices is spread through the land and we are surrounded by walking demons, men and women who have been emptied of conscience and have had their beings so saturated with Satanism and with demons that they could kill you, they could look at you, smile at you with one and put a knife through your throat and cut your throat the next and eat your heart or whatever as a ritual offering to Satan. There's a book called The Hand of Death Out. I brought back from California with me. There's another one called The Ultimate Evil, The Son of Sam, and all of these things are all interrelated. They're not, up, they're not just isolated instances. They're all part of a planned, a deliberately planned chain. You are in great and grave and continuous danger. You say, I stay in my house. They go into the houses. And I say again, everything I read like this leads me again to say, well, here we are. The only hope is spiritual warfare. The only thing that can even check these things is spiritual warfare. The only way to live through this mess. You read the reports. Banks and stock markets crumbling, the whole business structure going down, famines threatening, floods, storms, earthquakes. What are you going to do about it? You can't snap your fingers and make them go. 
You can't have a service and say hip to do and hallelujah three times and it be over with. You've got to have spiritual power to go through. The early believers did. And I believe that God's raising up a group now and training them so somebody will be around with some sense when this thing falls to pieces. And it's coming. How long it'll hold together? I don't know. Don't panic. There's no use getting on the panic button. Just get off the panic button. It's no worse now than it was when you didn't know anything about it. But it's been bad for a long time. It's getting worse. But you know what? When the devil does his worst, God does his best. So we can look for some of the most spectacular, miraculous happenings through the prepared vessels in these days of blackness and terror and wickedness and crash and disaster. That's the time when God's going to show his hand in miracle working power. And we'll have more than we've ever known to praise Jesus for. Hmm? Well, he says, Jesus is coming. He gave himself for us, verse 14, that he might redeem us from some iniquity and have a little bit left to threaten us with purgatory and hell. No, no, no. To redeem us from how much iniquity? All of it. And to purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Now, some people have thought that to be a peculiar person, you have to look peculiar. Well, most of you wouldn't have any problem with that anyway. Just go take a look at the mirror. You already look that way. It's not that kind of peculiarity he's looking for. The Catholic Church decided that by peculiar, he meant to turn your collar around backwards. And the men walk around in a black gown. And the, and the women walk around looking like penguins. And uh, he thought that, would, that makes you peculiar. That's not the kind of peculiarity. You've got others, Brother Joe visited a place where you, the ladies with the heels out of their shoes are immodest. Embarrassing. Trying to turn men on with your heels. You can get all, in all kinds of kinky, stupid things about holiness. Some ladies, you know, they have to wear their dress up to here and down to yonder and way down there for fear. They'll create something. Well, that's not the kind of peculiarity God was seeking. The peculiar people God's looking for, they are zealous of good works. And that is pretty peculiar. I mean people who are zealous, who, who live to serve. That's pretty peculiar, isn't it? And that's the kind of, he wants to purify to himself a peculiar people who are zealous of good works. That's what he's doing here. He said, well, they don't look very pure to me. Well, they're in process. We're not, we're not finished yet. You wait till we get to heaven. You, you take a look at us then. But right now, we're in process. And God's scrubbing us up here and scrubbing us up there. And he's using us. And until you're being used of the Lord to do the works of Jesus, shut up. You have no criticism coming to anybody. But God is busy purifying to himself a peculiar people. They're peculiar because they want to do good things. And the good works are defined by God's word and not by men's ideas. Doing the works of Jesus, salvation, deliverance, and healing, and reaching out in ministry to help men and women and young people come to Jesus and be found free and then walk on and teach them in turn how to turn others loose. And get them free. These things speak, exhort, that means to stronger than just tell about it, hit it hard, exhort. Now I'm exhorting you. My dad used to could speak, he would say, now son, I want you to do this. Sometimes he exhorted, he said, You'd better do that. That was exhortation. And the exhort and just before the judgment came exhortation. If exhortation, if speaking didn't get the job done, exhortation was the next step, and the next step was disastrous for a certain part of my anatomy. 
And I learned that it's better to move on the first speak. And certainly if you didn't get it straight on the first speak, to move quickly on the exhortation. He says, these things speak to the people, exhort them, and rebuke with all authority. Rebuke means cut it out. I don't like for anybody to tell me not to do something. Well, then don't do a bunch of fool things. Because those in leadership are told to rebuke that which is not good. And you better be glad somebody cares enough about you to say, cut it out. These things speak and exhort, rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Here he's talking again to a young man, but he's giving him a mighty big job to do. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, be no brawlers, that is, you don't go out and have fist fight over everything, Punch them in the nose, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. This is what the Christian is supposed to work for. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish. That means stupid too. Foolish people do stupid things. Disobedient. You're not going to tell, nobody's going to tell me what to do. Disobedient. Deceived. Were you ever deceived? No hands, please. Just think about it. Were you ever deceived? You thought, somebody said, oh, I wouldn't do that if I were you. You say, oh, shut up. I'll do it if I want to. And the next thing you know, ah! Said, I told you. Don't tell me I told you so. I don't want to hear it. Well, deceived. If you will not obey God, you will move in deception. A spirit, an evil spirit called deception will come and will move in on you. And this will cause you to serve divers. Now, divers doesn't mean like scuba divers. This word divers means different, various kinds, various kinds of lust, strong desires, and pleasures. You'll serve those. You'll become the captive of the things you like to do. But remember, before you get there, you've already been foolish, disobedient, and deceived. So what you're serving is going to be stupid and ignorant. You live in malice and envy. Your whole life will be directed by jealousy and envy. You'll be clawing at somebody else, trying to outdo somebody else, trying to have something somebody else has. Hateful and hating one another. Not a very pretty picture, is it? But after that, the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared after that he said the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared when you were in this kind of mess this is at the time that the love and kindness of God appeared not by works of righteousness which we have done you want to underline that in your Bible not by works of righteousness which we have done I have people all the time say well you know I was saved, but then I did thus and so and thus and so, or I didn't do this and this and this. Do you suppose I'm still saved? It depends on where you started. Did you start off with grace? You continue in grace. If you were saved because you were good, or because you promised God you'd be good, or you'd become good, then you're sunk because you didn't pan out. If you're saved because Jesus is good and because the grace of God is sufficient to meet all your needs, if you're saved because God accepts the sacrifice made by Jesus and that all of sin and come short of the glory of God and the death you earned passed on to Jesus, 
then his death and his sacrifice and his resurrection never changes. It's always valid. It does not depreciate. It's standing. The value still stands. And if you're saved by the grace of God, you're kept by the grace of God. You'll be motivated and moved by the grace of God. He's saying, mean, I don't want to. I didn't ask you what you wanted. Once you hook on to God's train, I've got news for you. You can't disconnect. As a matter of fact, you didn't hook on, so you can't uncouple it. You don't even know where the coupling is. You think you do, but you don't. And uh, he said, I'll just show you. Go ahead. Later on, when you get through thumping around on the railroad track, you know what happens to a railroad car that refuses to run on the track? He says, I'm tired of running on this whole track. I'm going to make a track by myself. I'm just going to jump off this old stupid track. I'm going to run by myself. I'm going to pick a trail for myself. Fine. Jump the track. Go ahead. The train will continue to go. But instead of riding on the nice smooth rails, you'll suddenly be on the cross ties. And you better pray for springs and shock absorbers because you're going to need it. Because bumpity, bumpity, bump, you're going to feel every single bump. And it's going to tear you all to pieces. And pretty soon you're going to be hot. Put me back on track. Put me back on track. There's not going to be anything left of me. I'm coming to pieces. That's what's wrong with these people out here. They jumped the track, thought they could run off the track. You don't disconnect just because you jump track, people. As a matter of fact, the train may pick up speed. And you're just thrashing yourself to death. Haven't you seen people out there jumping around and their, their, their life is coming apart at the scene and they're hollering, oh, help. Oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. Oh, everything's going wrong. She said, did you ever think about getting back on track? No. See, they're too stupid to get back on track. Well, when they get, when they get tired of being beat to death, they'll get back. Because you can't disconnect. Because God plugs you in and you can't unplug. You can try. This time I was sitting here tried to unplug and it didn't work, did it? I remember one time I was so disgusted. I was so righteous. So holy. Been so mistreated. And I decided I'm just going to quit. I'm not going any further. I'm just going to quit. Now this is a long time ago before I got sanctified. But, uh, and I just stopped. And I let go. He said, what happened? What happened? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. I expected to drop. I expected to all. I don't know what all I expected. But absolutely nothing happened. I found out that the Father's hand was still holding me. Guess what? When I let go, nothing happened because I just dropped in the hand of my Father. He already had me anyway. You think you can squirm out of that? Try. No way. He paid for you. And he paid such a price that he would never let you go. You're a love gift from the father to the son. And I don't know why he'd want to give you to him. I, I really don't. I have a hard time figuring out why he wants to give me to the son. But anyway, he does. The scripture says so. He purchased us in the marketplace of sin. And he's giving us as a love gift to his son because his son was faithful and completely obedient. And we are to be on display for all eternity as evidences of God's grace. And the angels are going to walk around saying, wow, that's the grace of God. What's that? I don't know, but these human beings, God, let them tell you. They know about it. We don't know anything about grace. They got it. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't receive grace. But these human beings did. It's a facet of God's character that was revealed in his dealings with human beings. Not by works of righteousness, which we've said. Somebody said, somebody asked me in California, said, so-and-so, I've asked Jesus in my heart, but I've never been baptized in water. Can I go to heaven if something happens to me? Well, I said, imagine so. The blood of Jesus washes sin off. Water and baptism tank might wash off the outside, but the inside's where it's dirty, so it wouldn't help you any. As a matter of fact, you say, well, supposing if I get baptized, what's going to happen if I come back up and I do something wrong? Well, if, you, if you're going to do something wrong and get lost again, 
when I baptize you, I'm going to put my foot on you and hold you. Make sure you make it all the way through. You know, when you go under, you're all right, and I don't let you up, and then you just go on to heaven, and you'll be finished then. That's not the way it works. You're raised to walk in newness of life. Because it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done. No, it's not by works of righteousness that we have done. Well, I'll tell you what, I wept and cried, I prayed, I drove myself, I preached, I witnessed, I passed out 10,000 tracks. I wore my little shoesies out, my little hoofies going up and down the streets telling people about Jesus. Oh, God is so blessed to have me on his team. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. But according to his mercy, he saved us. By the why, and you know, if people have that kind of attitude about being so proud of themselves, they're doing everything they're doing is for the wrong motive, and they won't get a bit of credit from the, from the Lord. Well, there were hundreds of people saved. They won't get a bit of credit for it. God honors his word, even if a braying jackass gives it. He doesn't have to have a human being do it if he wants to. So he honors his word, and if your motives are wrong, you don't get a bit of credit. Did you know that? Not a speck. If Jesus could use a rooster praying to convict the apostle Peter, then whatever made you think you were so important that you popping off would do any more good than the rooster did. I mean, it brought Peter to repentance, remember? He went off weeping. It crumpled him, just a rooster crowing. And that dumb rooster, all that was the matter with him, he thought that he was causing the sun to come up. Now, you certainly don't think God had a special crown for that rooster. He probably provided drumsticks not too long after that. When Rob and I were in Indonesia one time in Surabaya, we would have loved to have had chicken dinner the next day on several that started at midnight and went all night long. The one in light out there. I started sticking my head out there and say, You dummies, be quiet. It's not dawn yet. Shut up. Not speaking Indonesian, I didn't tell them anything. <laughs> Robert loved it. He sat bolt up in bed every time they hollered. We did get, the, we did get moved <laughs> to another room. But if a dumb rooster can be used to God. Look, why, a jawbone of a donkey in Samson's hand slew a whole army. What are you getting puffed up about? Hmm? A big old, a, a little old bumblebee can sting a mule and run it clean across the pasture. I mean, he can give that mule energy it doesn't know it has. It'll kick up its heels and go. I don't get all puffed up. It's not by works of righteousness which we've done, but according to God's mercy that he saved us. Just remember that. By the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Washing of regeneration. Which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. That being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Justified by what? By our works? No. By his grace. Justify means to be made just as if I had never sinned. That's what justify means. Just as if I had never sinned. When I am justified, I am made just as if I had never sinned. Just as if I had never sinned. Let that soak in. And we are justified by what? Our works, our faithfulness, no, by his grace. That makes us just as if. And we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now, hope in Jesus Christ is not like I hope so, maybe so, guess so. The hope in Jesus Christ is absolute. There is no doubt it's coming. It's here, it's forever. And eternal life comes through that, and that's the hope that comes through being justified. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly that they be which have believed in God 
might be careful to maintain good works. He said, you repeat these things to the people again and again that have believed so that they maintain, they keep on producing good works. These things are good and profitable unto men, but avoid foolish questions, genealogies and contentions, strivings about the law for the unprofitable in vain. Don't get wrapped up in religious hassles. It doesn't do any good. Nobody is convinced. And he said, just don't pay attention to them. I had a lady come up to me in California, bless her heart, and she walked up to me before the service and said, could I ask you a question, Pastor? And I said, yeah. Doesn't everybody, you know? Everywhere I go, they say, can I ask you a question? Could I just ask you one question? And I said, yeah. And she said, well, doesn't annihilating and demolishing mean the same thing? She'd seen the books back there. And annihilating the host of hell one and two was there and demolishing. And she really had a problem. Doesn't annihilating and demolishing mean that? I said, I don't know. She said, oh, yes, you do. I said, well, go look it up in the dictionary if it bothers you. That was a foolish question. How stupid. I thought, what log did you crawl out from under, sister? <laughs> a word. I don't mind trying to answer sensible questions, but she, she was just picky, 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 boo. Now, I didn't tell her what log did you crawl out from under. I just felt that way. <laughs> I do meet some strange people. Matter of fact, somebody brought me a picture in my office that's hanging in there. They gave it to me, and it's a picture of a squirrel eating on some nuts. It said, I should have been a psychiatrist because I'm good at collecting nuts. And sometimes I feel that way when I go out in some of these meetings and some of these strange people walk up with their weird questions. They'll come up and they'll say, may I ask a question? I said, yes. What is deliverance? <laughs> Or, how do you do deliverance? And I think, come on. You, you, you wouldn't believe some of the letters I get. People writing, practically demanding that I write them a detailed, researched proof about this scripture and that scripture and the other scripture. And they'll go on for 16 pages, badly handwritten, misspelled, horrible grammar, and they want me to take what would take a month of steady research. They want me to dig all that stuff up and send it to them because they are too lazy and too stupid to look it up themselves. You say, what do you do? I throw it in the garbage. You don't answer it? Why should I? I mean, anybody who thinks that a preacher has nothing to do but sit around and write commentaries for some dumb, lazy person doesn't have much sense. And what would they do with it anyway? If I wrote it up, they probably couldn't read it, judging from the way they write. It's incredible. These foolish questions, I am aware. Of this, this part I understand. Avoid foolish questions. I've had him walk up to me and say, where'd Cain get his wife? I say, he married his sister, and then I turn and walk off. <laughs> You're not supposed to marry your sister. I said, things were a little different then. Eve was the mother of all living. Now, what difference does that make? What's that got to do with the price of peanuts in Spain? And what's that got to do with your sin problem that you're trying to cover up by asking religious idiots questions? <laughs> Cain's wife doesn't affect you one way or the other. It's amazing what they dredge up. I think I've heard most of them. But every once in a while they come up with a new one that I haven't heard. Now, he says they're unprofitable and vain. A man that's a heretic... After the first and second admonition, reject. 
I've done that too. If you warn him once and he doesn't listen and he, doesn't, and he comes at you again, uh, just reject him. Say, I'm not wasting time with you. You can waste an awful lot of time with these turkeys. You know what I used to tell them? Why don't you go and study? You go read your Bible. Or they'll come, you know, and they'll ask me something. I say, do you have any of the books? Yeah, I have one of them. I say, have you read it? I say, which one? They usually have battling. I say, have you read it? Because the question they ask is described in great detail, answered with scriptures and everything else in that particular book. And they say, yeah, I've read part of it. I said, suppose you go read all of it. Since it's answered in there, you obviously skipped over it. And I'm not going to stand here and try to regurgitate for you what's already been written down and verified and checked and cross-checked. If you really want to know the answer, go read. That isn't very loving, but it gets me... Uh, otherwise, I'd be up all night talking to some turkeys that are really just lazy. They don't want to look at it. They want you to spoon-feed it to them. He said, knowing that this heretic is such is subverted, that is, he's all messed up. He sins, being condemned of himself. He's all in a mess, and there's no use in you trying to straighten him out when he doesn't have sense enough to even listen and try to work, work out things. He said, when I, uh, when I shall send Artemis to thee, Articius, be diligent to come to me. In Nicopolis, for I have determined there to winter, bring Zenos the lawyer, Apollos, on their journey diligently, that nothing be wanting them, and let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. He said, everybody is to produce. All that are with me, salute thee, greet them that are love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. And so ends a little book of a letter to Titus. If you've never asked Jesus in your heart, or you're not sure you have. Now would be a wonderful time for you to get that thing settled. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. If you've never done this or you're not sure you have, let me encourage you to do that tonight. Get it settled. If you can't settle it where you're sitting or you're standing, don't hesitate to come down the aisle. Tell one of the fellows down front here, I need to talk to somebody about salvation. That's all you need to say. Somebody will sit down with the Bible and be assigned to sit with you. And go over God's plan of salvation and see if you're sitting on it. If you're not, you can get on it. If you are on it, you can stop worrying and quit doubting and being full of fear. And start walking with Jesus. Either way, you benefit. That's not your problem, but you're driven, harassed, tormented. This is producing compulsive behavior, slowing down, stopping, or reversing spiritual growth and progress. You need deliverance from evil spirits. They are inside you. You may think you're so holy they're not, but they are. You are holy. You're full of holes, and they're in you. These signs shall follow them that believe in my name. Shall they cast out devils, speak with new tongues, lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Our people are equipped to minister in these areas. Our church serves the things of the Lord, family style. Everything is available at the same time. We don't have special services. So evangelism is available, salvation, deliverance and healing, and the gifts are all available. If you need them, you come. And someone will be assigned to you on a one-to-one -on -one basis to minister those areas that you need help. So if you need help, come to the front and come down the center aisle. Right now, let's stand and sing something.